Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Gates. I am a neonatal pediatric respiratory therapist at Duke University Medical Center. I'm so thankful to be here, even though I'd much rather be in sunny Orlando, but rainy Durham, North Carolina will just have to do. I will be presenting high flow nasal cannula in pediatric critical asthma. I would like to thank our team for their hard work and dedication to make this project possible. And I have no conflict of interest or disclosures. So as we all know, critical asthma is a common reason for PICU admission. Patients with critical asthma typically require continuous bronchodilators that are delivered either via mask or high flow nasal cannula. And our PICU has seen a shift recently towards more high flow nasal cannula use because it allows kids to be more active and it makes physicians a little more comfortable allowing them to eat and drink and even take walks around the unit. But aerosol delivery via high flow is controversial and there's conflicting evidence on the outcomes like length of stay, need for escalation or intubation. We hypothesize that children initially treated with high flow nasal cannula would have a similar hospital length of stay as those treated with aerosol mask. And don't we all wish that every baby we put on high flow was this happy about it? Because I sure do. This was a retrospective study where we extracted data from the electronic medical record we included all pediatric asthma patients with an MPIS greater than or equal to eight, admitted to our PICU from about June 2014 to March 2020. All subjects were managed by our RT-driven bronchodilator protocol. And this protocol uses the MPIS score, which is a pretty good indicator of illness severity in our PICU. High flow nasal cannula and NIV are not part of this protocol and they're a decision made by the clinical team. We extracted data including demographics, medical history, initial respiratory support, initial vital signs, MPIS over time, and need for NIV or heliox. Subjects were divided into two cohorts by initial respiratory support, high flow nasal cannula or aerosol mask, which is a decision made by the clinical team. So our primary outcome measure was hospital length of stay, and then the secondary outcome measures were PICU length of stay, time on continuous albuterol, and MPIS over time. The data were analyzed with SCSS B25. Non-parametric and chi-squared testing were both performed to evaluate the differences between the groups. And the significance level was set at an alpha of less than 0 0.05. So this is a visual representation of the flow of subjects in our study. We started with 189 subjects that were identified with an initial MPIS of greater than or equal to 8 admitted to the PICU. 18 were excluded based on their initial respiratory support, which could have been NIV, nasal cannula, or Rumer. The subjects were then divided into either aerosol mask or high flow nasal cannula. In the aerosol mask group, 43% needed escalation of support to either Heliox or NIV. And then in the high flow nasal cannula group, 41% needed escalation of support. So they were pretty similar. As far as demographics, the groups were pretty well matched. Unsurprisingly, the high flow nasal cannula group was younger, probably because as we know, younger patients are much less likely to keep a mask on. And then there were no other significant differences between the groups for demographics. As far as results, there was no difference in hospital length of stay between the groups, which was our primary outcome. And then for secondary outcomes, there were also no differences for PICU length of stay or time to MPIS less than six. Time on continuous albuterol was actually shorter in the high flow nasal cannula group, 
but the length of stay was the same, probably because we still need to wean off the high flow before the patient can leave. The groups were pretty well matched for admission MPIS, which is a good predictor of illness severity. And then of note, 24% of patients in the aerosol mass group were eventually transitioned to high flow nasal cannula, which could have been for a patient intolerance, respiratory distress, or RT preference, we really don't know. Heliox and NIV use were pretty similar between the groups. And then the little blurb at the bottom just says that the poison regression analysis confirmed the results of this unmatched sample. So this graph is a progression of MPIS over time. The light blue is high flow nasal cannula and the dark blue is aerosol mask. So you can see that they performed pretty similarly. And even the differences are only a one point difference in MPIS which really wouldn't look much different clinically. So as we talked about before, the studies that have been completed to date have found pretty conflicting results on the actual benefit of high flow for patients with asthma. Our results did show that high flow and aerosol masks were equivalent for treating pediatric asthma in our PICU. And we did acknowledge a few limiting factors in this study. As this was a retrospective review, we were obviously limited by the data available in the electronic medical record. And then high flow nasal cannula rates and weaning were not standardized or managed by our asthma protocol, um, which could have impacted our results. And there may have also been some selection bias on who got high flow nasal cannula versus who got aerosol mask. What did we learn from this study and what do you mean there's no difference? Well, there are no significant differences between high flow nasal cannula and aerosol mask in the treatment of pediatric asthma. And then these results to support the change of practice that we noticed towards more high flow nasal cannula use and it reassures us that we were doing the right thing. As always, a multi-center randomized control trial is needed to confirm these results, and it would also aid in the great debate over high flow nasal cannula in asthma. And this concludes my presentation, so thank you all for listening in.